Hey GovCon Giants family, welcome. And today's guest, Heather Bleas, has a remarkable story that I'm so delighted to share with you. Some of you may have heard a portion of her story on a previous YouTube Live that I had, but this is the actual story, the one-on-one -on -one interview that we've all been waiting for, how to build out a massive contact center using federal government contracts. And she shows us everything she did and how she did it. So stay tuned for this upcoming video with Heather Bleas. I'm Heather Blees, and my company is called Savvy Links. Wow, Savvy Links. I was actually trying to figure out how to say that. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that you hadn't even tried. I did not. Up until this point in time. That's very, that's very savvy of you. <laughs> I, I was waiting. Well, I, I actually, so just before we technically started, what I do, and I didn't make it to you, I did make it. I'll share it, but I normally watch an interview of a person like on YouTube to see how they pronounce their last names and their company names so I can get it right. That's a good idea. Yeah. That's a, that's a tip that I've just learned from you, right? Thank you. So that's, a, well, so another tip I'll tell you is interesting. I have so many of my friends that don't Google me. So they'll ask me questions and I'll say, you know, maybe you should Google me. Right. And what I've learned is you can actually Google anybody. And we, we forget that a lot of times when we're asking questions or asking for help, we never actually bother Googling people. So it's, it's remarkable how many of the people that I've known for years don't even know what I do. <laughs> 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 and so they'll ask me questions that I said, if you had just like looked up, look me up for maybe two seconds, you might find out that I'm very well versed in this particular subject or, you know, I have a lot of experience in this area, but they never bother look Googling someone. So that's another tip that I give people. All right. Google, Google your friends. Sometimes right. it's like, if you don't, if you're like, I'm really unsure about what is, what is, what does Jane really do? <laughs> Google her and see if anything pops up. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll Google my kids, see what they're up to. Uh oh, hell. oh no. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this about kids. Uh, if you tell your kids, how old are they? Mm, they are 30, 28, uh -huh. 26, and 17. The 17-year-old will appreciate you being on YouTube with a YouTuber. Right. They're all very well-versed in social media. So. Right. But, but the new generation of kids... Uh, like even the teenagers, they look up more to YouTubers than they do to actors and actresses. Oh, I know. I know. They don't right. do what they don't watch TV. They don't watch TV. Know? Or they'll watch YouTube on TV. Right. That's what, right. They watch YouTube on TV. So if you right. want, if you want to make a cool impression with any uh, teenager, just say, Hey, I was on with a YouTuber today and they'll just think you're the coolest <laughs> <Can't wait>. person, <laughs> right? Use it and let me know how it goes. I, I, I will. <laughs> I, 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 it never disappoints. I, I even do it to like pizza guys. Sometimes I'll do it along like just random people. Um, and they're like, in fact, I had a guy come for like a campaign to your house where they'd taken, um, you know, doing the campaign surveys. And I said, you know, I told him, I said, Hey, you know, I'm a YouTuber. The guy goes, YouTuber pulls it up and he looks it up and it's like, wow. And, and it just, it just changes. You're famous. Perspective. You're famous. <laughs> it changed their perspective. So, but oh, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's a, that's another interesting point. So, but back to your story, Heather, uh, because I was reading just before we came on today, a lot about you and your history, and you have a fascinating story to tell. And so we definitely want to dive into that story today and have you share a little bit about how you started Savvy Links and the business. But before we get into Savvy Links, can we talk first about the actual order of how did you get into that space? I was reading about you helping found another company in a similar marketplace that you built out called EnvisionNet. Right. Right. Can you tell us a little so, bit about that. That was uh, a company that I started back in 1995, which is probably long old, uh, old, you know, I'm probably, probably before you you were born, but, <laughs> <laughs> no. but, um, so yeah, I, out of college, I, I, um, have an electrical engineering degree and I worked for digital equipment corporation for 10 years. And the company that I was, um, 
the company or the, the plant that I was working in was put on the, the market for sale. And long story short is I didn't really want to go with this, with the sale of the digital uh, manufacturing plant. And so I, um, without really knowing what I was getting into, I started a company called Envisionet and um, to provide tech support services to digital and just hired you know, two people and bootstrapped that company, um, which is a, a, a contact center company. And um, that was quite a wild ride. It grew um, from the me and two other people that I had hired to a company of 2,500 people and six or seven rounds of venture capital and big clients like Microsoft and Dell. Um, it ended though in um, a chapter 11 bankruptcy. It was an issue with actually um, one of our larger customers um, signed us up for some big contracts and then withdrew quickly and we ended up kind of holding the bag and we're not financially strong enough to weather the storm. So, mm. um, so anyway, wrap it up. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and we, we um, ended up having, we sold the company and it was operating, you know, an operating entity, but um, it was definitely a, a, a learning experience for me. Wow. So yeah. you went through venture capital funding for that company? A, a lot of it. It seemed like that was most of all that I did. It was uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so time consuming. <laughs> That's very fascinating. Now, what, but I see you were an engineer at Digital Equipment Corporation. How did an engineer go to starting a business to do, you know, contact service work? Well, as I mentioned, it, I was, um, I had three kids. They were all you know, under the age of four at that time. Um, you know, had a, a, de a decent job at digital, but, um, and I was managing that a little group that did tech support services for digital for, an, for another, um, another entity in, okay. in Massachusetts. And I didn't want, I wasn't sure what my, um, future was going to hold with this, with the, the manufacturing plant being sold. Mm. So, um, you know, the idea popped into my head, well, you know, perhaps I could start my own company, hire those couple of engineers and, um, and then contract back to digital for those services that we were currently providing. And okay. that's, that was how my mind was thinking, but it was a huge step. And I kept weighing, you know, should I, you know, should I go for it? There's something driving me to want to do it, but then it's like, it's so risky and you know i didn't have you know any of the money to do it I had to actually sell my we had to my husband and i had to sell our house to to actually start that company did you really okay yes i like that that's a great that's a great that, no because a lot of people ask questions how do we start a business you know how do we get that first contract what do we have to do and I, you know i've suggested to people maybe they have to relocate from the very expensive new york real estate market to a you know, a less expensive marketplace to cut down on expenses, but you actually sold a house. Right. And moved um, into a second floor apartment of a house, another house with the three little kids. And mm -hmm. that was the, um, the environment starting the company. And um, it is, kind of, it's kind of, I think entrepreneurs, you know, for me, it was, I, I was all in and it, same thing with savvy links. It wasn't, that I had a, a lot of money and this was just a trial. It was in both cases, you know, either you, you know, either it works or it's going to hurt. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I like that one. I like that one. I like that. Right. One. So yeah, all in and, um, and, and the company was very successful for a, a number of years, but, um, you know, we just were on that verge in 2000, uh, you know, around 2000 with a big dot com crash. And, you know, it was a bit of a. Uh, uh, okay. That makes that connection makes sense now. Okay. Right. Right. 
Mm. So, um, so that was a good, that was a great learning experience, and my, many of the learnings of Envisionet were carried with me, of course, through right. um, the, the beginning of Savvy Links, right. which was my second attempt of of um, growing a company in this industry. So. All the mistakes that I made at EnvisionNet, I did not make <laughs> in Savvy Link. So, <laughs> so, no, that's 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 wonderful. <laughs> uh, can you name a couple of those those things that uh, may stand out that you remember that would help someone else, right, to avoid? Well, um, you know, one of the I have lots of things. You know, I, I could write a, a book about the things to avoid, but. My one of my my kids actually asked me, you know, that question. You know, you know what's what really was different about your experience with, you know, Envisionet versus you know where you are now with um, with Savvy Links. And one of the biggest things that I took away is that you know I was what what my my. Son was asking, "Is like how old were you when you started Envisionet?" I was, okay. I was thirty years old. Okay. And um, and I doubt, you know, I I think what I what I lacked was belief in myself. I I knew the things that I in my heart what I needed to do and what I what what decisions were right, what decisions may need to be looked at, but I I was I deferred to people that seem to have more experience or, you know, the venture capitalists would try to say, Oh, you need to hire somebody to run your company, not you. Mm-hmm. Cause you don't, you know, cause you're only 30 years old. You're an engineer. Mm-hmm. How do you know how to run your company? And, you know, so I, I listened to them and it's like, well, I, I, I thought I was doing a pretty good job, but okay. And I hired a, a CEO and, it was the worst decision ever, and wow. you know, I, it took me two years to get uh, separate that person out of the company, and mm. it was um, it was destructive. But I should have listened to myself and had more confidence in myself. Mm. Then, I mean, not to say that another thing that I I think is really important for entrepreneurs who are trying to start a company or have started a company is to, you know, ask for, ask for advice, but, it, and, you know, seek counsel from people that have, have done this before, just like what you're, you're offering to do through this podcast is, is share learnings right. with other people. But, um, you know, so you know, having a network where you, of people that you can ask, and you know, you know, what was your experience, or do you know how to do this? You know, that's extremely helpful. But at the end of the day, the you know, as the owner, or you know, as a CEO, as the you know founder, you know, the decision comes back to one, you know one that you've got to be comfortable with. And uh, you know, I think listening, you know, be, having the confidence to listen to myself and my own instincts was lacking back when I was 30. Not so much this time. (laughs) Ah, I like that one. But I would, um, I guess my, I would have a differing opinion. Looking at someone who was 30 that raised venture capital money is a major effort. So I believe you did have confidence, right? Right. Have you ever um, raised money? I, I not venture capital. No, I, I've raised some uh, little money, not not major money, very little, a couple hundred thousand, maybe. Right. Well, that's actually with this with Savvy Links. I I raised a a little money at the beginning with um, some angel investors. Okay. And um, it's not nearly as rigorous as you know a, you know doing a formal venture capital funding but um that's it and just that just one one small investment of local um um regional investors and you know 
that was a, another difference between EnvisionNet and Savvy Links. And we became profitable much more quickly mm. and didn't need to raise the additional money. And okay. so it's um, that for me that allows me the time to work on really building the business and focusing on the business and not on trying to, um, you know, stop the bleeding or, you know, our, mm. our fund you know, right. growth that's um, outstripping the, the profits of the company. Not to say that the, you know, the first couple of years of starting Savvy Links were, were hellish, you know, <laughs> they, they just, <laughs> the, you know, when you're starting from nothing, um, and trying and 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 trying to build a you know a foundation for a company and you know get to a point of profitability, and you know typically companies aren't profitable for a you know, couple of years as until the, you know things start to flow. Um, those are that's tough time you know, especially you now I I can't even tell you how many times I emptied my bank account to, you know, my personal bank account, every minute, every dollar I had to fund payroll. That is what has been my, it was my experience early on. I'm glad, I'm so glad to be beyond that point. You know, that's, oh. that's tough, but I think, you know, it's the reality for a lot of people who are all in with their companies. We're going to, we're going to, that's going to be our theme for today is right. It's being all in with your business and your company. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I like that theme. What, what, um, it, it appears there was an eight year gap between when you finish with envision that to where you start savvy links. What was the mindset going into launching savvy links? What were you thinking? What, you know, what was going around in your head that said, you know what, I'm going to get back into this. I'm going to start again. Well, you know, after Envision, you know, I, I was not planning to go into this business ever again. <laughs> you know, but, and you know, I I had um I had a, a babe, my fourth child, and I had had three boys, and then Envisionet, and then my daughter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was it was actually um, really nice with. Um, I, I almost had a, a, a reprieve when I had um, my daughter Elsa. I could enjoy her first year, and, and I spent the majority of that year with her and not working. But um, you know, over time, I, I ended up doing some consulting projects, helping some other people um, w with the launch of their companies, helping them to raise money and so forth. But um, Eventually, the company that purchased my old company, EnvisionNet, mm -hmm. was purchased then by another company, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they so that company called and their CEO called and said, "Hey, you know, um, we need some help with um, business development, and you know, would you be willing to come on board and?" Um, and lead that function for us. Okay. And, and so I, it was at a point where, uh, you know, well, bottom line is I said yes. And it was, they were based out of uh, Atlanta. Um, after six months, you know, they were in, they were specifically interested in government contracting. Mm. And I had no idea I, I didn't know government contracting at all, but I was willing to take it on and and try. And as a larger company that, you know, had no, it was not a small business at all. It had um, been in business for quite a while. It was, they had no past performance. Mm -hmm. um, after six months, the CEO said to me, well, you know, at, well, I, I actually, shared with in a conversation i said i'm not sure how how unless you acquire a company that has government contracts i don't know how you're going to get into the market because you mm -hmm. don't have any of those things that, that right that you need yeah looking for yeah the chick box right and and but then the, the it occurred to me it's like well 
hmm, I could start a company. It would be a woman-owned small business. And perhaps if you help me with it, then um, you know, perhaps I could you know, subcontract back right. to you eventually. And it got me thinking about the, the, the concept of and looking up you know, what are small business certifications. And the, the area that I lived in, um, Brun the Brunswick, Maine area, had a base that had just closed. And so they were designated as a hub zone area. I thought, well, you know, if I could become hub zone certified, a woman owned small business, right. you know, why not start a business? And the contracts would just come to me and I could <laughs> employ a lot of people. And, you know, instead uh -huh. of us just paying out taxes all the time, so you know, why not be able to create the jobs here where we need them, and you know, be you know, you know, an employer of the federal government. So those that was my, you know, rose glass uh, glasses idea of you know how you know starting the company and you know being focused on trying to win you know federal contracts. Now, is is Savvy Systems different from Savvy Links? Savvy um, Systems was another company that I started in, during that in-between time. Okay, okay. And yes, it was very different. It, and it was actually the name Savvy, S-A-V-I, mm -hmm. Superior Audio Video Integration. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are like, engineer. <laughs> You are an engineer. I, you know what? I, I had so I'm an engineer also, industrial system engineer, and my first company was called Wireless Integration Multimedia Service Provider, W I M S P, right? <laughs> and when I talk to people, they go, "It spells WIMPs." I'm like, "No, that's, it doesn't spell WIMPs." But if you switch around the, the letters, it you know you could see it as WIMPs. But ah, that's funny. Okay, right. I like that. So savvy, it does. It is an acronym for something, right? Yeah. So yeah, so that was you know, a very different company, you know, also service oriented. But um, uh, so I I was doing some um, lighting, um, automated lighting, and you know, anyway. Long story short, is I end, I ended up um, merging that business with an on another contracting business locally, okay. which was um, why it was a, a good time for me to look at the other opportunity and doing business development for that, that other company, even though that didn't last long because I realized that, um, you know, there was a potential of, um, you know, that I couldn't get that, that idea out of my head that there's a business here and right. right. You know, federal contracts. You know, it's, it'd be it would new. It would. It was new to me. I had no idea, you know, what that even meant. But it seemed like those programs were set up for a reason. Mm -hmm. The um, with the SBA, you know, the Hub Zone, Women Owned Small Business, right. and you know, I was going to figure out how to use those to our to um, create a business. And so, how did that work out for you? Well, the the other big piece that was a, a critical component was um, I met with the, the redevelopers of the military base that was closed, that were, was closing. So this okay. was, um, it, and it was you know, because I, you know, I was interested in, you know, as looking ahead at, at um, government contracting, the hub zone certification was important. And so I had to locate the business on the old um, Navy air base in order to be gotcha. okay. uh, at the headquarters in the hub zone. And, you know, I was still kind of at that point deciding, um, should I go for it or, sh you know, start another business or not? It's like it's such a huge undertaking. Um, and I guess, you know, two things. One is I, I met with that, the uh, executive director and 
he shared with me that they had funding programs to help businesses get off the ground. It's like, you know, there's this, you know, this particular program that you could apply to. We have a, you know, a fund. Um, and, you know, suddenly, you know, there was a very real way to finance the, the start of the business where, um, you know, through these various programs. But there's always the, the question that you know, came back to me, and it was the reason I started Envision It back when I was 30, where you know, it, was, it was a huge risk. And I pictured myself you know, at the, in the nursing home, you know, 95 years old, and thinking to myself, well, geez, I wonder what would have happened had I tried starting that business back when I was 30. You know, my life would have been, you know, would it have been successful or would it not have been successful? And, you know, I got to the, the you know, I got, I got to thinking that, you know, both with EnvisionNet and Savvy Links, you know, I convinced myself that I had to try because I would, I would not be able to forgive myself for not trying. And so, I don't know if you know this, but Jeff Bezos said the same thing. Oh, he did. He did. He was interviewed by his brother and he said an article, they said, what made you start Amazon? He said, I just picture myself at, you know, 90 years old. And um, I look back and I want to have the least amount of regrets as possible. Interesting. Well, there. <laughs> so you have the mind of Jeff Bezos. <laughs> or he has my mind, actually. Oh, or he has your, or he, oh Jeff Bezos has Heather's mind. <laughs> Okay, I'll go for that. No, <laughs> no, I just it's no, it's very interesting that that's that's exactly what he said. The same thing, right? Well, so I like that. That's interesting. It's a big decision, as you know. Yeah. Well, I think as entrepreneurs, what I found is uh, sometimes we have to psych ourselves up, right, to to get into the game to be able to do these things because, like you said, it is. I mean, you're basically sinking or swimming, right? That's the way you describe. It. You're all in. Um, I know oftentimes for me, when I make decisions, like for example, I'm going to venture out into something new uh, this week. I, you know, I say, I treat it like an experiment. So I just say, Hey, it's an experiment. I'm going to try it. We're going to see how it works. And it, it takes away the pressure off, of, you know, for me at least, and trying something new and different because I say, well, if I, you know, if I don't try the, it's just an experiment. So uh, I'm going to learn from the outcome regardless of what that looks like. And, and that's the way that I uh, take on new tasks. That's a good perspective. Right. And it's I've shared it with a lot of people it, and they help, it, it helps them because a lot of people are so afraid. So I just say, look, just treat it like an experiment. And that alleviates the fear. If you can do that, you know, from, you know, for me, it had, it was sink or swim because, you know, financially, you know, I, um, I could, it was, it wasn't just a financial experience, uh, experiment. No, no, right. No, no, starting a business. But, yeah, I get it. But if you, you know, for, if, if you can do it in a, um, a more moderate way where you're not, you know, where it's not as risky, that's great. Mm. I just didn't have that, um, luxury. <laughs> right. No, right. I see. I see. So you're, you're talking with the redevelopers, the executive director, and they're telling you about different programs. Right. And so, um, so I applied for all, you know, all the funding that I, I could and, um, and launch, you know, launch the, the company, um, you know, worked on the business plans and, um, you know, there's always that go, no go. It's like when you, you know, when you s sign the lease, a five year lease for a new space uh, and, you know, sign on the dotted line for the funding and all, and all that stuff. You know, I, you know, finally got to the point where, um, you know, I had made those commitments and, you know, started the company and um, had one client lined up and, so I, you know, I hired two people to help me um, build out the technology and and you know help with the hiring of you know a team of 
20 people to serve that first contract. And, um, you know, that was the beginning. <laughs> so. <laughs> Can I ask some clarifying questions? I know people are going to ask. They're going to, you said you had some, some programs. What were some of the programs that you took advantage of for funding in the beginning? Can you remember well, that? Um, they, there was a, there was a small, um, business, um, it's a, it was a regional, a regional small business development loan. Okay. okay. Um, and then there was another, um, um, it, it was also, these were, I think, uh, um, state specific loans. They were not federal programs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was one that was called, um, it was the MRDA loan. So it, it was tied to, um, a regional, a regional district or something. Okay. Right. And, um, that one was very specifically used to help build out the facility by the computers. Um, and there was, you know, there's that other loan. Um, it was like a $50,000 loan with a regional development authority. Mm. And so we have, we have those, those were everywhere. Yeah. So that's good information because we have those uh, here in Miami. We have the Biscayne Foundation, Bayside Foundation that offers $50,000 loans starting up. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, the, you know, those were the types they, and um, that, you know, without those loans, um, I don't know that I would have started the company because I, you, you have, you know, you need to have some type of funding right. lined up to, you know, I, and I'm sure people don't anticipate the amount of funding or they probably underestimate the amount of funding that it actually takes. Right. And, we all and, do. Yeah. Um, no banks reached out to help you out? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. No. No. I mean, thanks. That, that, you got all the money in the world when you don't need it. And that's then right. You need it. That's right. Thank you, Heather. A lot of people think, well, Eric, if I just get a contract, won't the bank fund that contract? I said, I don't know any banks like that. So I'm asking, maybe up there, maybe Maine, they do something different. No, it's amazing. That, but they, they really are not, um, banks don't really, as you well know, they're, they're risk adverse. Mm. So, okay. But um, one thing that I did end up using early on that was expensive money, but it was pretty easy to come by was um, receivables financing. Mm -hmm. So there were, you know, there are companies out there that will allow you to, you know, if you have um, solid contracts with customers, They'll, you know, they they'll kind of allow you to um, to uh, borrow up to ninety percent of the receivable, and so okay. that actually was a bridge that helped me through um, a year or a year and a half before I could actually secure a bank line of credit. Okay, so no, that's, that's good. That's helpful. That's no, that's great information to share with people the um, accounts receivable financing. Right. Okay. So that, and then, um, and then I did also go to a local um, angels group, you know, the financing angels. Mm -hmm. um, and every state has, has um, those types of organizations that are looking to individuals that are collectively looking to invest and, and help local businesses get off the ground. That, were they able to help you at all? Yes, I oh, okay. did close a, um, a round early on um, with a group called Main Angels. And okay. it, so there were probably like 10 people, 10 to 12 people that each individually invested um, at, you know, at the same time, same terms. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, and that was help, very helpful also. Let me ask this question. How did you learn about like what were the appropriate terms to do for angel? You know, I, that's something that I struggle with. Well, the, um, how did I know that? Let's see. I think <laughs> I, <laughs> Right. I mean, you see that stuff, you, you just do it automatically, you know? Well, you know, I ended up having, um, 
I think is what's really important is having and 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 finding you know a, a good attorney and a good CPA. You know, having those, although expensive, for a, a new company, having you know a tr those types of trusted advisors. You know, that's critical, and so. Um, that's you know, I, I, you know working with you know at my attorneys in terms of uh, the terms and and so forth and I had quite a lot of experience with those types of contracts and agreements um, having you know having done the venture capital rounds right. for but you know it was pretty much just the you know the, the attorneys and this the the language was pretty standard but then you know negotiating the value um, you right. know, that, that has right. to come into play as well. Right, right. Yeah, I think that was the hard part for most people is, you know, what is the value? And, um, you know, how soon can you, and again, I don't know the structure of the deal, but, you know, uh, I understand most, they, most investors have a set amount of time in which they want their money returned back to them, right? So right. it's like, what's the value of the company today and how's, quickly can I get my money back out of this? And what type of return am I looking at in that period? Right, yeah. So, okay, but your attorneys, your CPA helped you kind of manage, navigate through that. Right, and, um, and that was the only, that's the only money that, um, that I've had to raise, you know, for this company. Okay. Um, which is a, a big relief because it is a you know as i mentioned it takes a lot of time to raise venture capital and the like so okay so and i don't have a board of directors you know since oh. i you know i was that a choice that you just did you i mean did you is there a reason well, why not or is there a reason well, why oftentimes so um, the reason i had a board of directors with envisionnet was that and the anytime you know you accept funding of a sizable sort then you know people want to have the ability to monitor what's going on in the company and that's the you know they they want a seat on the board and you know they they own a, ch a big enough chunk of the company so they can justify being able to help with certain you know certain decisions and so um in any case, um, you know, with this with this company, I was fortunate not to um, have to rely on venture capital funding. And you know, the board of the you know boards can be great, but um, you know, board of advisors is is more what um, you know what, what is appropriate for a company that is, you know, is you know owned by you know one majority shareholder. Right. Okay. Okay. So you start off with the first customer. You said you hired two people to build out the technology and also to recruit the first 20 persons that you need to fulfill that particular job. Contract. Right. I, I was actually, that was, that brings me to a question that I was, was going to ask later on, but um, you know, and looking at your website, it looks like you're in four or five different market segments. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you've got to train people up in each one of those. I mean, that seems like a huge undertaking for me. Well, it's, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it is absolutely. But, um, you know, the, the company, you know, having started with, you know, one person and three people, then 20 people, you know, all serving, you know, you know, a couple of small, small clients. And then, then you add another contract and then, you know, you know, add the training and then it's like, oh, this, you know, a couple months later, then another contract. And then, you know, I'm doing QuickBooks and paying the bills and, you know, hiring people and doing, the, you know, helping with the training. And, you know, eventually it's like, oh, I need to get some accounting help in here. And so, mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's slowly adding on, adding on, and evolving. And you know, it's over. You know, well, the company's seven years old, so it's over um, a period of seven years 
and and seven years of rapid growth. You know, we we have grown quickly, but you know, but methodically and you know, evolving those lines of business as we um, have um, added contracts in those sectors, essentially. So it doesn't happen overnight, I guess is what I'm saying. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I I would agree with you. Um, And yes, we'll talk about the, the ink ratings that you received. When you were looking for or building out the training for the first 20 people, right? What did that look like? Did you, well, the, did you, you know, where did that, no, I'll, go, I'll let you finish. Well, and it, it was a matter of, um, you know, it's kind of like trial by fire. It's like, you know, we have a contract. It's like, mm-hmm. we, we need to train people. It's like, well, we need, let's see, let me look up. I, there's some, there's some, uh, mandated training from the state. You know, we've got to figure out, you know, sexual harassment and, you know, video terminal display and, you know, all, all of these other, you know, trainings that have to happen just because you are an employer employing people. But then the contract specific training, you know, what is it, what types of calls are we going to be receiving? And, you know, what, how do we access the knowledge base so that we can answer calls on your behalf? You know, it's um, the, the work that, you know, this is kind of part of our core business is understanding our client business and accessing tools so that we can provide guidance and, and either technical support or customer service answers to um to their to their customers who are inquiring to us by a phone call or email or or however that's kind of, that's what we do and <laughs> and we do it in all different ways we develop it ourselves if our clients don't have it mm. you know all prepared but you know oftentimes they you know they do have training materials that we can use and okay. so yeah I'm imagining that there were already players in this marketplace when you came into it, right? Right. Did did you did people move their business and move switch switch over to you your company, or are these new companies that are starting out and they need to expand and grow, and so they're hiring you to help them with that? I'm trying to get a feel for the landscape. Well, def- those are the, the, that's exactly. Um, the, the two kind the two sectors that we we typically are dealing with companies that are growing very quickly and they realize that they need to focus on their core their core business and um, with whatever it might be it might be a technology it might be a um, a service that they provide and they they realize that you know if they work with us that we can um they don't they they don't want their engineers taking calls and trying to fix those kinds of problems they want you know they want to be focused on on growing their core business and so that that's why they they call us so that we can um we can take the their customer calls and inquiries on their behalf and that you know that's all we do that's our core business and we do that you know very well and you know so um that's one aspect of the business that we support and the other the other sector is the government sector you know as i had mentioned we sought the um the small business certifications mm-hmm. woman owned small business first and it took us three tries to get hub zone certified it was <laughs> it's really really it was hard, okay. but um, just anyway, because we had, um, by the time we, we went for that certification, we probably had like, you know, 100 or 200 employees. Mm. And so to collect all the information on all of those employees was a big task. So in any case, um, we ended up with our first government contract um, back in 2014. And the reason 
we were selected to work with this this big contractor was that they had small business goals and mm-hmm. and you know the system works you know they mm-hmm. you know the the small business goals you know hub zone you know oftentimes um the Department of Labor or, you know, OIG, you know, they're, they're looking or DO, Department of Education, you know, they, they've got agency goals where they want 3% of all their revenues in, um, going to hub zone or going to woman owned small business or, or veteran owned businesses. And, and, you know, that's, that's um, how we ended up with our first government um, contract and, has helped us tremendously with growing as a subcontractor to these these bigger contractors who need to satisfy those small business goals. But 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 Heather, they had to find you. How did they find you, or did you find them? Well, there's <laughs> because when I when and I want to say that only because I know someone's going to hear this. You're going to say, "Oh, if I get registered and then I get certified, that someone's going to come knocking on my door." And I'm sure that was no. not the case for you. It's absolutely not the case. And, <laughs> you know, that's, that was one, um, w- one idea that I had that was, you know, totally inaccurate, but, oh, I just signed up for these programs and they'll come find me. Right. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> not the right. case. Right. Um, it's really hard to get those, get a foot in the door yes. in government contracting because, well, the first problem is you have to have past performance. Mm-hmm. How do you have past performance if you're a pretty done a new contract, company? Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like the chicken or the egg. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's so. Um, that's really frustrating as a new company. You know, they have all these great programs that are encouraging new you know, entrepreneurs to start companies, and and in these small business cl- classifications, but actually getting your first contract is so tough because of that lack of experience. So as you said, it's a chicken and the egg and, you know, have not really knowing how to approach the government, um, you know, the, the government contracting arena. Um, I took advantage of the industry days, you know, and, and, you know, called some of the there are there are you know larger um, federal contractors that um, that have small business goals and they have small business um, advocates within their own their own firms and so you know, I started to reach out to those people and just kept contacting them over and over and over and trying to create the relationships that um, over time would lead to um, when they have an opportunity, they could, they would think of us and, and eventually business would come by, you know, just the, um, you know, the pressing and the, uh, the, those were pressing those relationships. It's, and you know, know, some of there's, I'm thinking of one company where, you know, I, I met with this contracting, it wasn't a contracting officer, but it was the, a small business liaison within right. um, a large federal contractor. Okay. And just, you know, every year after year after year, and it's been seven years and we still haven't done work together. We've, we've been on some things together, but some of these things take, can take a long time. Wow. And in other cases, you know, there's, if a, a contractor wins business you know and you know they they're under contract sometimes they can pull you in the back door and that can come pretty that's that's a, a much uh, faster way to yeah so we started out by subcontracting with the with big contractors okay and um that's what helped us to gain our past performance and um you know only in the last two years have we actually evolved to the point where we are submitting bids as prime contractor. Mm. Wow. And, wow. No, that's, that's, uh, I'm glad you pointed that distinction. 
the um, I will say I found it sometimes easier to be a subcontractor than a prime contractor. Um, when you look at the paperwork and the requirements, oh, yeah. <laughs> would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a lot. It's, it typically is. I mean, it depends on the complexity of the, um, of the actual bid that you're right. responding to. Okay. Some, some are not as complex as others, but you know, they, they come with, um, a lot of, there's a lot to a uh, paperwork. There's a lot to it. And even, you know, even with a, a subcontracting gig, for lack of better words, I mean, <laughs> I like it. Some of them, um, you know, we're just renewing one now. Our, um, we've actually, we've just finished our fifth year and we're starting a new phase, a new contract with this as a subcontractor with this particular company and it's just oodles of paperwork and you know you have to attest to this certify this you know read all the fars agree to them and on and on and on and on <laughs> it's but that you know that's part of doing business with the federal government you know what what percentage of your business is the federal government now well, let's see. Um, we actually have recently started to do work with state government. Okay. okay. And um, the working with the various state governments is not as complex and doesn't come with as many of the the rules as you know with the federal government. But um, I'm just thinking of. I'm picturing our financials, and I would say that mm, probably about half of our business is federal, at least. Really? Right. Wow. Wow. Well, Maybe well, even more, um, but it's it's, change, it's evolving. It's changing. So in the beginning, you were uh, all, you didn't have any federal contracts when you started, right? Right. And then in 2014, you, you got your first one. And then, wow, that's interesting. I I, uh, I didn't look that up. I thought it was smaller. So it's a significant part of your business now. Your right. Well, we, I mean, number of clients, um, we have more commercial clients than we right. do the federal. But the um, the volumes of the federal contracts are larger So in right. terms of uh, revenue. Yeah. And then we... Uh, I actually um, I interviewed with Mary Corn, Pearl Interactive Network, and she's in a similar line of business as you are. And she said the same thing that the in the federal world that she would get long term contracts, which would allow her to you know secure and not allow for any gaps. And so when you're making when you're hiring uh, people, she's in the same line of business when you're hiring people. Uh, particularly for, you know, you can ha guarantee them long-term jobs and long-term positions. Right. And usually, you know, they're um, you know, five-year contracts, right. sometimes even longer. Right. So, right. Right. yeah. Right. Uh, now, what is your, uh, now that changes the dynamics of that question, because I was going to ask, what does your ideal customer looks like? But now that you're in the federal arena, do you have a, 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 an ideal customer profile? Um, well, as I mentioned, you know, we do like to um, balance between commercial contracts, federal and state. So, um, you know, on the commercial side, as we, as I mentioned, companies that are growing quickly and, um, you know, wanting to hire us to take their level one, level two, level three support calls or customer service inquiries, we tend to work on projects that are more complex. So, um, you know, it takes quite a bit of training and know-how for us to be able to support our clients, customers. So, you know, um, but, you know, such as we do work for um, federal student financial aid, for example, and, um, Signing up for insurance benefits and trying to work through the choices with the clients or 
um, you know, various support for uh, for techno you know technology and um, and type technology type services and um, in, with states we were working with some to do unemployment benefits and, and that sort of thing. So um, that you know that's the type of work that we focus on a little more complex and um, you know we have with our you know the one nice thing is that we, with our clients you know we've not lost any clients um, you know we, we actually just get better and better at, at doing work on their behalf um, growing our knowledge base our expertise so you know you know, we've had some clients, you know, for seven years we've been doing them. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So, so they, I didn't they really give you more. Question, but, no, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I still like your answer. Uh, that's interesting. Is the, would you, what would you say contributed to, again, I'm looking at the stats from 2013 to 2016, made the Inc. 500 list. And uh, you had that explosive revenue growth. What would you say contributed to that? I, you know, I would say the federal contracts because um, they they were the, you know the per, the first couple of contracts that we um, were able to win for our company. They were pretty large. We, we I mentioned that we started. Well, our first government contract, we started by um, hiring a team of 25 people in Mississippi, of all places. And um, it worked out great. We delivered a, a great service and the subcontractor came to us and said, well, can you hire 25 more? Like, okay. Can you hire 50 more? Okay. Mm -hmm. And before we knew it, for a, a company that is growing from you know very you know, teeny tiny to one that has, you know, you know, it's getting into the millions in, in revenue. Right. I mean, the, in a, a fairly short period of time, you know, that's where, um, you know, ending up on number 28 on the Inc. 500 happens. It's like, you know, that first year in business, we had, um, you know, revenues of 120,000. Mm. But by the third year, we were up to 4 million. Wow. So um, that's that's where you can make those uh, those types of numbers on the on the um, Inc. five hundred or five thousand. Right. It's a lot harder now. To make <laughs> 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 you have okay. right. You know, you're, if you're you know sixteen seven or I don't know eighteen million, then you know to make those to make kinds those of numbers, numbers you got to you have to become on Facebook or somebody. <laughs> Yes, it's, right. it's tougher, but we'll we just made the list again. So, um, so we're we're still in it, but um, I don't know what number we are. So I know <laughs> yeah. we're not twenty eight. <laughs> right? no, I saw you had eight hundred percent growth, right? Right. I right. saw that eight hundred percent growth, which is, I mean, that's still like you said, that's amazing. Um, and that's remarkable. And so that contract took you, like you said, twenty five to fifty people to. And was it the same type of work service or did, did they expand? Like, did they just expand the scope? Did they, did they diversify what they were looking for? They, well, you know, I think the one we've been always really good at delivering the, the work that we provide for our clients. And so, so they, you know, they pushed more, they had more volume that they could give us and they, they did. So uh, they increased okay the work that we were doing. Meanwhile, we, we were able to um, secure another contract with mm -hmm. a, a different company who also wanted, you know, I think initially um, 25 or 30 people and that went great. And then they, another project came along. It's like, Oh, do you think you could hire an, like a hundred people to serve us? You know, we've got an issue that we need to work through, you know, of course we can. So, we, you know, you know that those couple of contracts contributed to the, you know, that uh, right, right, because you know, with these bigger um, government contractors, as a, a, a teeny company, um, 
you know, going from 25 people to 125 or you know, 200, um, you know, that's a big deal to us. You know, we were all hands on deck making it happen. Mm. And, um, you know, that was, you know, how we cut our teeth with the first um, federal contracts. Did you have to spend a lot of time in Mississippi? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, se- it, it seems like a, a silly question, but people want to know, right? They're, they're, oh, yeah. I don't want people to make the assumption, right, either way, right, that, oh, she did all this from Maine and, or, you know, or she spent all her time in Mississippi. I want them to hear it from you. Well, um, yeah, so that first group that, you know, that I hired in Mississippi for the federal, that was our first federal contract. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going down with my, um, with one of my kids, my, eight, I think my son was like 18 or 19. Okay. I had nobody else. So <laughs> he and I <laughs> went down, like, we worked with the, what's his, what's his name? What's his name? <laughs> his name is Carter. Okay. Carter, you're coming with me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. He, it was summertime. So he was out of school. I needed to hire, you know, 25 people. So, uh-huh. um, yes. And he, you know, and he, he was up to see a new, uh, up for an adventure. And it, it yeah. was, we worked with the career center and interviewed, um, in, you know, people. And, you know, the two of us ended up hiring our, our very first team. And um, before long, we ended up securing a, our, our own offices down there mm-hmm. and um we had uh, actually we've you know we've we just gave up that lease um for a, a much larger um facility a couple of years ago so um over time the work that we were doing in mississippi grew and grew and grew and we also had the need to um so we and it, we we leased a, a former co- contact center with 450 seats, and um, yes, we you know spent spend a lot of time in Mississippi happily because we have such a fantastic team down there. And um, with COVID, I haven't been able to visit, and so you know that's that's kind of a bummer because otherwise, I, you know, personally, I spend almost once a month in um in mississippi okay okay and that's during a- really busy times we actually have people that um you know we've at least a house for six months and just had people there all the time that's interesting how has COVID impacted your business it um we did you know we we have facilities where you know that yeah because like you're in a contact center, center right? <laughs> right exactly so um it you know as it turns out um we were able to b- deploy everybody um, to from who were, who was in the facility. You know, we sent them home with computers, and um, you know, ninety I would say ninety percent of our workforce transitioned seamlessly to a work from home environment. And so um, it's working out. You know, we we never skipped a beat with um, providing our services and. Um, it's worked out great, actually. People love the working from home. Some people can't work from home, so they've stayed in the facilities. But you know, there's plenty of, of space. I mean, we have a 450 seat facility, and you know, 20 people working out of it, so, right. so they can adequately space, space. And, <laughs> okay. and adhere to all the you know the the hand washing. You know, wearing masks and right. you know what's the difference between a contact center versus a call center oh one word <laughs> <laughs> call contact <laughs> no i just asked because i i read when i read your description i said contact center and i'm like okay well, call and center i don't know it's kind of i think that's the old that's the old term right so that people think of you know they think of people crowded in mm. you know it's like a, derogatory or, or negative and some well but um as it you know the technology has evolved it's they it's not just phone calls we do 
chats, emails. Sometimes we work on casework. Uh, um, so it's the actual multi-channel interactions is, you know, the contact kind of broadens the, the scope of what, you know, one thinks about as a call center is just taking calls. Okay. Contact center, you know, it's however a, a customer wishes to contact you. They can. Uh, so is that why, that's why you call it omni-channel solutions? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. right. I got it. I'm following. See, I'm, make, I'm connecting the dots. I'm connecting the dots. Right. I, I know we're, we're coming up on time here and um, we went through a lot of stuff. So the thing is, you know, if you're out here and people are listening to this, that's, you know, one of the things I say, what would be if uh, someone was listening, they said, hey, how could I help you? Right. I'm a contracting officer. I'm a contracting agent. How can we help your company? Right. Uh, what type of opportunities might you might you be interested in either today or in the near future? And what are what are you asking again from uh, the well, Yeah, I said, what type of opportunities might you be interested in? So if you've got your your say twenty five meter mark, fifty meter mark, hundred meter mark of the types of projects that you want to do either now or in the near future, what do those look like? Well, we we are very um, interested in continuing to build the, the you know the um, portfolio of federal um, clients so um, we've gotten to a point where we can scale very quickly with um, you know for instance we were helping with unemployment phone calls and and we were able to hire several hundred people in a really sh- a short time period and you know, we've been able to manage them very well and deploy them at home. So it's this whole COVID thing has you know, allowed us to prove to ourselves that we can continue to scale quickly and safely and and manage our um, our our work and our our employees effectively. So, you know, we we'd love to continue to do more work um, servicing federal customers as either, you know, the, we can respond to the primes, but, um, you know, for companies that are larger companies out there that are looking for small business partners, we are still a small business, but we can scale. And so we, you know, those are the kinds of opportunities that are most interesting to us. Would you say tech support, help desk, is there anything that you favor? Um, well, you know, tech support, um, customer service, that, you know, as I said, it's um, really of, of any time. I mean, the kinds of, of calls that would come through federal contracts, you know, it's, we're not doing infomercial responses. You know, we could help somebody with their, you know, tax returns or, um, you know, as I said, we do a lot in the, uh, for federal student financial aid or, okay. um, you know, we, you know, insurance, you know, Medicare, you know, those kinds of programs are, are perfect for us. Okay. Okay. No, that's great. That's great. And for the, the, the people out here listening that just, you know, spent an hour and change hearing your story, how do you think that they could like, you know, starting from the beginning to the end, how could they, what could some of the steps that they could take to, to recreate uh, the level of success that you've achieved? Well, the one thing that has um, been very helpful uh, that I, I pretty much just stumbled upon, and it was a couple of years ago that um, you know, I, I con- I'm constantly reading and, and trying to trying to figure it all out, just like everybody. Right? No, no, that's that's all of us. That's all of us. Right? Uh, that's all of us. Right? In our you know our path and our journey, but. Um, you know, in reading various business books, and I came across one that um, resonated with me, and it it's called um, Traction. I don't know if you've ever heard of it by oh. Gino Wickman. Okay. And the it's it's a very and there are a number of different um, business books out there that you know help you to provide um, clarity on on the company goals and 
Um, you know, there was, I don't know, there's a gazelle series way back and the Rockefeller habits and right. all of those types of things. Well, um, anyway, this, this particular author and the, the methodology used in the book, um, was helpful just to provide some, um, a framework to bring, um, a consistency of, of um, goal setting, you know, uh, annual goal setting, quarterly goal setting, and um, ensuring that the organization is aligned. And you know, right now our company's uh, you know quite quite large. We've got you know a lot of people working in finance and and um, HR. You know, we've got you know over a thousand employees, whatever. But you know, even having this type of structure for a new co a new company starting out and and setting goals, you know, the you know what what do you want to be in ten years? You know, what's what's the three year picture? You know, what is, what are you trying to do in the one year time frame? You know, what's what's the annual goal? And then um, what am I going to try to get done? What are we trying to get done as a company in the next quarter? And then you know the setting the the um, routine of reporting back on achieving those goals and having the alignment in the company um, it has made a huge difference. Um, you know, it's been um, you know, having that discipline approach doesn't come naturally, I don't think, to people. But you know, so you know, relying on a structure to help build that consistency throughout the organization has been really helpful. You said you wrote a business plan early on. Have you looked, have you had, went back and looked at that business plan? Um, you know, as a matter of fact, the, the business plan, um, the financials, we actually almost hit right on the mark wow. and you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it seemed far fetched. It's like, yeah, we're going to be a million the first year, yeah, 4 yeah. million the second year. And, and we actually hit the numbers. And the crazy thing is, you know, I'm, I've, I actually wrote the next three years on my whiteboard when um, back, you know, middle of last year. It's like, we're going to do, you know, this amount next year. And people are like, no way. <laughs> Guess what? Yes way. That's right. We did it. <laughs> Somehow when you sort, when you put, put it out there and believe in it, you have a pretty good chance of things coming your way, you know? I think so. Yeah. So, yeah. I agree. No, I'm a big vision, um, belief in vision boards. Yes, absolutely. I, yeah. No, I, um, I did the same thing with my, with my YouTube channel. I said, hey, I want to hit this many subscribers by this date. Then I want to hit this many subscribers. And I mean, it was like clockwork. I, it, 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 it's like the, like they say, the world conspires to help you. <laughs> right. It's the, um, you know, the law of attraction. Yeah, the law and of attraction, right? That's why they say you should ask for big goals, right? Not little ones, because they're going to give you exactly what you ask for. That's right. <laughs> Watch out for what you ask for, right? <laughs> you mentioned gazelles and Rockefeller habits. That sounds like principles I learned in the Entrepreneurs Organization. Are you, are you part of any other organizations like EO or YEO, YPO? Oh, I think that, um, yeah, I think the, um, is it e EO, Y yeah. or? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Those are the tools that, you know, that's the, um, that's the tool set that right. I'm referring to. Right. right. Yeah. That's what that tool set. I'm like, that's, those are tool sets that they, that they give us when we're learning. Oh, good. Well, I'm not part of that organization, but you know, as I said, I stumbled on the book just accidentally and okay. I listened, I, you know, I ride my road bike. Um, I try to get out there every day and I listen to books while I'm riding. Mm -hmm. So I listened to that book a couple of years ago and it's like, wow, that was good. I actually listened to it again. It's like, that is really good. And so then I bought the book and I keep it close by. And oh, that's I've a good book. I've got all these things marked and I've, I've bought a copy for all of my leadership team. And, you know, if we're, you know, 
we're working through the tools and it's like, okay, we're going to actually, we're actually right now just saying we need to document our core processes and, you know, app, you know, it's like, okay, guys, you know, can you read pages 155 through, you know, 160, and then we're going to have a discussion about this. So, you know, I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a good, um, it works. You said yeah. you write your road back every day. Yes. Is that for physical health, mental health, a little bit of both? Oh, definitely both. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, uh, keep explaining. Go ahead, just share with people. Then I'll share. Oh, well, you know, I just, you know, I think, you know, getting enough sleep, eating well, getting exercise. You know, another thing one of my sons said to me is, um, because I was telling him that I actually have to block out a, a time in my schedule to ride my bike. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I said, well, sometimes I feel a little guilty because it's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> and he said, mom, don't feel guilty. The, you know, the number one most important thing for you to do as the you know, leader of your, of your company is for you to keep healthy and to have your a clear mind and, you know, have a, a you know, being able to maintain a positive attitude wow. and he's right. He's and right. being able to, you know, get outside, get some fresh air, you know, have you know, a break by you know, listening to a book. You know, sometimes it's, a business book sometimes um, not um, but ha just having that break and getting that you know a good chunk of exercise in um, helps me to tick better <laughs> so <laughs> no 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 I, I i agree i actually i shared a post like that this morning um that says even if you don't want to do exercise for your physical health you should do it for your mental health right just because i mean it allows me to come up with creative ideas uh, it also allows me, like you said, to take away from the anxiety that maybe you're facing or some so or some challenging situations that you're dealing with. It just, I don't know, I guess physical pain, it takes, it does something to you mentally, right? So right. it takes away that mental anguish, the physical pain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else you want to leave us with some parting words? I know I uh, take up a lot of your time. I, I want to be respectful of you. Just, you know, if you want to leave some parting words and then we'll, say goodbye well i you know i think that you know you you kind of also just hit upon it with the you know importance of just um taking care of yourself but um the you know the positive attitude is really critical positive attitude um solid intentions solid um business goals you know, that is catchy. And, you know, if people in your organization or your customers, you know, can, they can, they can sense your vibe. And if you are, a, if you exude can do, then you will do no, no question. So anyway, that would be my parting comments. The no. importance of that. Heather, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. No, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye now.